Hi, this is Alice K. Ruckelhaus from Threshold of Hineni, and I'm here with kind of a bonus video in my Esther series. I am going to review for you the Bible that I use for my Bible study. Uh, it's my favorite Bible of all time. I'm not necessarily saying that it's right for you, but I'm going to review this so that if you're looking for a Bible version, this will give you a little bit of information so that you can figure out what's best for you. I've been getting quite a few questions from people who were following the Ephesians series asking what Bible I recommend for them to use. I can't really recommend a specific Bible for you. I think that with so many English versions, so many good English versions, uh, I think that it's best for you to find something that's just right for you, not just right for me. One of the things that I would take into consideration though is what Bible does your pastor use? What Bible is being used for preaching the word in your church? Because that will probably be the easiest Bible for you to use, especially in church, so that you can follow along. If you're very, very familiar with the Bible, then it works okay okay to branch out to other versions, but if you're using a different version than your pastor in church, it can be a little hard to follow if you've got something else, even though both versions are perfectly good. Um, I'm not going to go into explaining all the different aspects of Bible translation and Bible versions and how to choose the best one. I found a really, really great article, which I'm going to link before, so I don't feel like I need to state all that over again. So instead, I'm just going to review for you the Bible that I use, that I've been using for quite a few years, which is the New Inductive Study Bible. And this is put out by Precept Ministries, which is Kay Arthur's ministry. And I would really, really recommend that you check out her ministry. You can find her website. I'll link that below. Uh, there's also, she has videos that you can watch. And I, I love her approach to studying the Bible. It's very much like my own, which is to help people give give people the tools so that they can go to the Bible without commentary, without somebody telling them what it means, and they can see for themselves, let the Bible comment on itself. And so that's what that's what this Bible is all about. So this is, the uh, mine is the New American Standard Bible. That's the version that I really like, and um, I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment. But the uh, New Inductive Study Bible is also available in the, um, English Standard Version, which is also a really good version. I used it for the la for the first time last month in January when I used that illuminated scripture journal uh, that I really liked. And I have a review on that too. I'll link that below. So I'm not going to spend time talking about that right now. But I did really like the version. It's very similar to the M New American Standard. Uh, there's just a few differences. It's a little bit more modern, maybe not quite as awkward in some places. And so I really liked it, but I'm sticking with the New American Standard because that's what I'm used to. <laughs> um, I would recommend as far as uh, what Bibles you get, if at all possible, try to have at least two versions of the Bible. One of the things, um, I will go ahead and get into this, one of the things about Bible translation, which is true of any language when you're translating from one language to another, is that you really can't translate exactly word for word what something says. For one thing, different languages have different grammatical uh, makeups, and so if you translated from Spanish to English or from German to English or from Greek to English, the word order is going to be different. And so it'll sound kind of funny. So translators have to move that around so it makes sense. But the other thing is that individual words, a lot of individual words have their own nuances. And when you go from one language to another, the corresponding words don't necessarily have the same nuances. And so that's why when you read a biblical translation, they are often different from each other because the the translators have chosen just a different one of those nuances that that word has. And I like to think of it as a diamond. I don't have a diamond on my ring, but um, so I can't really show you. But if you have a diamond, it has a whole bunch of different facets, and that's what helps to reflect the light. And a lot of words are like that. They just have a lot of different meanings. And, um, you know, the one that probably most people know about is the Greek word for love. And I'm, I won't get into that again either because you can find that just about any place. But that's a good example of 
in English, we have the word love. We don't have a special word for brotherly love, for sexual love, for unconditional love, um, or for friend love. Uh, but in some languages, they do have different words for those. And so, um, so when we translate, it can come out meaning something a little bit different. The other thing is that English is a living language, and so it changes. The King James Version was a modern translation back at the time that it was translated, but now, besides the fact that older manuscripts, which are closer to the originals, have been discovered, and so we can look more scientifically at what the Bible writers probably said, um, besides that, the words that were used in the King James now sometimes mean different things. Like in 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about charity. Well, that means love. But when we hear the word charity, it means something completely different. So when we read the King James Version, if we don't understand that, it can mean different things. Now, if you've grown up on the King James Version or you know Shakespeare really well, then reading the King James Version is not so difficult. I grew up with the King James Version, so when I read it, I know what it means. It totally makes sense to me. But for a modern reader, a lot of times it doesn't make sense. And so there's nothing more holy about the King James than there is about other versions. I know I'm going to get a whole bunch of people who are mad at me for that because people say, oh, if it was good enough for Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas didn't use the King James. It was translated 1,600 years after them. So, so um, anyway, it's a, it's a modern translation at that time, just as these translations are modern now. So what we're looking for in a version is something that really, that we can understand, so that we can understand God's word. And having really as many translations as you can, but having at least two really helps because then you can see some of those different facets of the word. One of the things that I like about the New American Standard Bible is that it has footnotes um, that will tell you, so you can see in the middle there, it will tell you another one of the nuances of a word if it's important. For example, I've talked before about Romans uh, 6 where Paul says to be instruments of righteousness. And in the New American Standard, they translate that instruments, but then they have a footnote saying that another aspect of that is weapons. Well, that brings a whole new ball of wax to that subject. And so it's helpful to know what those other nuances are. And you can often get that from reading different versions. The other thing is that if you're going to have a couple of versions, what I would suggest is having one that's a quote unquote word for word. And like I said, you can't really translate word for word, but that's the, that's the intention is to translate as close to word for word as possible. And then also to have one that's more phrase for phrase or thought by thought. And I'm not going to go into all that. The article that I will post below, which is like I said, really good, but also very long, <laughs> um, has has a good description of that. And you can also ask at a Christian bookstore or ask your pastor to explain those differences to you. Your pastor is probably a really good person to ask to help you find the version that's right for you. So, but what I want to show you about the Inductive Study Bible, this is not about a version. This is about a format that the Bible is put in. And the New American, the New Inductive Study Bible comes in two versions. It comes in New American Standard, which is what I have. It also comes in uh, English Standard Version, which is the one that I used last month. And um, but but what this Bible K. Arthur put together through Precepts Ministries, and this Bible is set up specifically to help you to be able to study the Bible. You don't need any other book to study the Bible when you use this Bible. And she has at the beginning, I don't know, maybe 40 pages or so explaining the inductive study method and including charts like here are some symbols that she suggests that you use whenever you run across particular themes in the Bible. Okay, at the beginning of each book in the Bible, she'll have an introduction to that book, like this is Genesis, and she'll tell about the history of it, who wrote it, and so on and so forth. And then she'll suggest some themes to look for. And there are a couple of ways that I've used those themes. One is I've put them all on a three by five card 
along with their symbols. And as I've gone through that particular book of the Bible, I've looked for each of those themes and written the symbol either in the margin or above the word, uh, depending on how it works out. Um, that is a little overwhelming for me. I can't keep track of so many things at once. I can keep track of two, maybe three things. And sometimes there's like seven or eight or 20 <laughs> themes that you want to be watching for in a book. So what works better for me is to choose one, two, or three of those themes and stick to those when I'm reading through that particular book and studying it. Uh, part, part of the reason why I've been able to pull back in that way is because it occurred to me uh, really not that long ago. You would think it would have occurred to me a long time before this, but maybe it hasn't occurred to some of you either. I'm probably going to read through the Bible many, many more times in my life. So I don't have to find every little teeny tiny detail of a portion of it right this second, this time that I go through. I can really focus on one theme or you know, whatever it is that God's leading me to look for that particular time in that book of the Bible or in that topic, if I'm studying a topic. So, uh, so anyway, that's one of the things that I like. And then she has some things to think about here that will help you as you're looking, as you're reading through that book of the Bible, and it will help you to kind of think through it. Okay, so another thing that's also common in a lot of other Bibles is cross-references. I hope you can see those. Okay, so you see in the middle margin there, and you see where it says 1-1-A, one, one, Psalm 102-25. Okay, those are verses that carry the same concept. So you can, if you're seeing this and you go in the beginning and you think, Hmm, I wonder where else the Bible talks about it. It will give you four different references for you to go and look at. And you can spend all day <laughs> travel chasing these rabbit trails. It's really, it's really fun. It's very interesting. It's a great way to get to know the Bible and to know how it's all integrated and how it all fits together. So that's really cool. Okay, so one of the things that's different about the Inductive Study Bible is that rather than having a title at the beginning of each chapter, she has a place for you to write your own title. Okay, so here we have chapter one of Genesis and you have a place to write what you think is the title of that. Now, each time I've, I've had four or five different copies of the um, New Inductive Study Bible. Sorry, I have to keep looking at it. Um, <laughs> I've had four or five copies of that and I and each time I might come up with a different theme, a different title for that chapter um, because God's showing me different things. Okay, another thing that I love, love, love about this Bible is look at these margins. I mean, these are huge margins. There's lots and lots of room for writing in here so that you can take notes during sermons or during your devotions. Okay, lots of space to write. And that's really helpful. The other thing is that she has charts throughout the Bible and she has them right where they need to be. This, this one is of the rulers and prophets of Jeremiah's time because this is in the book of Jeremiah. Okay, so I don't have to go and look in the back and see if I can find a chart or a map that shows me what I want to know about that particular passage. Here we are in Nehemiah and there's a map. This is a map of all the places that are talked about in Nehemiah that will help us to understand it better. She also has little insights of oh, other charts, you know, of how, how the different books of the Bible relate to each other. Um, when there's a passage of time, she'll show the years so that you know when this happened and the corresponding, like this story is also in 2 Chronicles 13. Okay, so that's really, really helpful. So there's just a lot of super helpful stuff in this Bible. Now, another thing is that at the end of each book, of the Bible, she'll have that book at a glance. And this is all for you to fill in. You get to put all those chapter titles that you came up with. You're gonna put the one for chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and so on. So this is gonna help you to summarize it. Um, you're gonna write in the author, the date, the purpose. You know, here's the keywords that she suggested right there that you look for. Um, so you're, you're going to fill this out. And sometimes there are other charts too, like in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a place for you to fill in where those um, 
different stories take place in the other Gospels as well, so that you can see how they correspond with each other. Okay, so there's just a lot that you can do with that. And then at the end, <laughs> I love this. I don't even know if most people even look at this kind of stuff, but I love it. There's a whole bunch of appendices and indexes. So indices, sorry. So um, that if you want to know, hmm, I think I saw a map of the Chaldean world or something like that, you can find where it was. Or um, if you want to know about, here, here's like a history of the Bible and it tells like how we got our translations and so on and what the accuracy is of them and how they figure all that out. It's, it's, a, it's a summary, but it's pretty long. I mean, I took a whole semester class just on that and um, she's done a pretty good job of, of summarizing it. There's also one appendix that talks about uh, how modern history relates to the Bible. That's really, really helpful. Um, and then of course, and then stuff about grammar in the Bible and stuff. And then of course there's the concordance, which is also a really important tool to have most, well, maybe not most anymore, but a lot of Bibles now should have a concordance at the end. If you don't have one in your Bible, then uh, there are concordances that you can buy. And I am going to do a series at some point about different Bible tools and concordance would probably be the first one that I'll talk about. So, um, so I won't really talk about that now. But those are all things that are really useful when you're studying or reading the Bible or when you're just looking for an answer. What does God say about such and such? Okay, so so these things are, are really helpful for getting to know God's word. Of course, the most helpful thing is just to read it. Um, read it as often as you can, especially if you're thinking about how you can apply it to your life. Then you're going to remember stuff. And of course, memorizing scripture is also really, really important. And I've talked about that before, so I'm not going to talk about it now. But anyway, I just wanted to give you an idea of that. Oh, one other thing. I was looking at Amazon at the New Inductive Study Bible. And besides all the other ones that I told you about, all the other covers that they have, they have a gorgeous dark green leather or imitation leather, I can't remember, with beautiful scroll tooling on it that just melts my heart. But this one's still new enough and I haven't used it up completely, so I can't justify getting it. But So I'm kind of jealous of anybody who needs a Bible right now and ends up getting that one. It is absolutely beautiful. You've got to check it out. So anyway, I'm going to link all these things below in, my, in the um, description section. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to tell you or send pictures or whatever, but uh, this is just a really good Bible study tool. I really like it. And um, like I said, I've been using it for probably 20 years or so. I'm not exactly sure, but I've been using uh, different copies of this Bible for many years and I really, really like it. I really appreciate it. It's helped me a lot. And it's one that somebody who's new to reading the Bible can use so that they can start reading the Bible on their own. Okay, I will see you on Monday for the next episode in this series. So Friday, we read chapter one, Saturday, chapter two, Sunday, chapter three, Monday, remember to read chapter four before you watch the video, preferably. And each day, remember to ask, what did I learn about God from this chapter? And what did I learn about myself or people in general that I can apply to myself. And then the third sort of question is what, di what difference does that make in my life? How am I going to apply it? All right. I will see you on Monday. Love you all. Bye-bye.